originally from Germany and I received my MD and PhD degree from the University of Heidelberg. And during my time in medical school, I had a scholarship by the Foundation of German Business that allowed me to travel and get training at different institutions. So I went to Austria, I went to Toronto in Canada, to Tasmania and Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And while I was at Mount Sinai, I was introduced to Kurt Hirschhorn, their former chair of human genetics. And as I met him, I asked him, Dr. Hirschhorn, tell me, what do you think is the best place in the United States to get training in medical genetics? And without any hesitation, he said, if you want to become a medical geneticist, you should go to Baylor College of Medicine. So that really changed my plans dramatically. And I applied for an elective during my last year of medical school at Baylor. And they allowed me to come here for four months and I got exposed to the clinical work and the basic science they did. And it was a life-changing experience. I had never enjoyed working as much as I did then. And at that point, I, at the end of the four months, I decided to apply for formal training and come back for residency in medical genetics. I would say, if you look at me and the work that I do right now, you will realize that almost all of the projects that I'm working on started with a single individual patient whom I encountered in clinic. And even years later, as I study the genes and the mutations, as I study the proteins and their functions, I still have these families in mind. And that's important when it comes to motivation, because basic science can be very frustrating. And having these families and their challenges in mind, you know, s makes you see the bigger goal and it really helps you overcome your frustrations. I would also say, you know, um, the interplay between medicine and science is very evident in the field of molecular genetics. And it's such an exciting time right now. It's really the age of discovery, almost unlimited discovery. Every week, there are new gene disease uh, associations established and new disease genes being identified. Um, so this is just a tremendous time and almost to the point that you have to limit yourself and that you are in the lucky situation to pick the most interesting, the most intriguing projects to work on because there's no possible way you could work on all of them at the same time. I think these kind of awards, they have critical importance for junior faculty members because what they really do is they provide seed funding to transition, to get your data developed into something that makes you a strong candidate for more formal uh, funding mechanisms. I would also say it was even more important for me um, as a non-permanent resident because a lot of the funding mechanisms with the NIH I'm not eligible for. So this particular award allowed me to hire a technician and work on a fairly high-risk project uh, in order to accumulate more preliminary data to then later apply uh, for additional funding. In 2011, I received a Clinical Scientist Development Award from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Um, this is a very prestigious, um, fairly competitive award that's given to clinical scientists in their early stages of career. Only 12 to 16 awards are given every year. And that award helped me um, as it allowed me to embark on a large clinical and translational research study that has been going on for almost three years now. In addition, um, I was fortunate to receive funding from a local family, um, the Joan and Stanford Alexander family. They were particularly interested in funding research on psychiatric disorders, and they themselves work relentlessly to take away some of the stigma that's associated with psychiatric disease. So they themselves are a true inspiration for me and everything that I do. 
I was very fortunate when they decided to fund me and my lab and they allowed me to really start my own independent lab at the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute. So I'm very thankful to them and my lab has now been named after them. Um, so you could say the general idea is to understand how genes influence human behavior. Um, I study genes and genetic alterations that predispose to psychiatric disease, autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, bipolar, and others. And what we do in the basic science lab is we model these diseases in animals. So we take out the gene of the mouse genome and we look whether the mouse then recapitulates some of the human phenotypes such as speech impairment, deficits in social interaction, cognitive disabilities and so on. Um, and the mouse models stay incredibly valuable because they not only allow us to look at the phenotypes but they also allow us to look at what the genetic alteration does to the brain's function they allow us to study circuits that are affected. And then ultimately, we can use them as a tool to study therapeutic interventions before we move them back into the clinical arena and human patients. It can be fairly challenging to study behaviors in mice because obviously their behavior is so different from ours. And we are, as humans, deficient to interpret their behavior because we interpret it from a human perspective. But there are certainly things that you can look at. So, you know, the core features of autism that are impaired speech, repetitive behaviors, and altered social interaction, you can look at all of these in the mouse. So, for example, speech, uh, we look at what's called ultrasonic vocalizations. Um, so they're specific machines that can make the vocalizations that the mouse generates, can make them audible to us as humans. And there are certain patterns that we can investigate. Social interaction, we can look at whether a mouse that's engineered to have a genetic abnormality prefers to interact with an object rather than a partner mouse or whether a mouse is, you know, happier just being by itself rather than interacting with a partner mouse. And then there's a multitude of tests to look at cognitive abilities and the ability to learn. Also, the, the component of autism that's concerned with repetitive and obsessive compulsive behaviors you can study in mice. I think a good example would be the study that's funded by the Doris Duke Foundation, which is subject to my Clinical Scientist Development Award. Um, this is a study that looks at individuals with chromosome changes that affect a particular gene, which is CHRNA7 on chromosome 15. CHRNA7 encodes for a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor gene. And as part of the Dor Doris Duke funded study, we examine patients who lack one copy of the CHRNA7 gene, and we investigate their clinical and behavioral phenotypes. So we do very in-depth phenotyping with the help of psychologists to find out what their behavioral profiles look like. It becomes evident that almost all of the individuals who lack one copy of CHRNA7 are challenged in their cognitive and intellectual dis uh, abilities. On top of it, um, about 30 to 40 percent of all, all of these individuals meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder. And a good number of them also have a history of epilepsy. But on top of it, they have fairly complex behavioral phenotypes, including depression, um, uh, oppositional defiant disorder and even aggressive behaviors. Now what's particularly interesting about this project is the fact that there are medications out there, some of them already FDA approved, some of them in advanced phases of clinical trials that aim at particularly this protein. Um, 
in order to increase its function. So they nicotinic agonist drugs. They have been developed um, to help with smoking cessation or because of the genes relationship with Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson disease. But we hope that we can repurpose these drugs and use them in individuals who lack a copy of the gene, boost the activity of the remaining receptor in order to alleviate some of their symptoms. Well, it's certainly interesting that most of the individuals with schizophrenia have a history of smoking. And some of them say that smoking helps them to function better, uh, to be better able to concentrate, and so on. The CHRNA7 gene itself has been linked to schizophrenia, and I see in several of the adults that I've studied that they do have schizophrenic phenotypes as adults. Now clearly the CHRNA7 gene is not responsible for all cases of schizophrenia, but you know that's part of what we're investigating, that if you give an agonist drug that boosts the activity and in some ways mimics the function of nicotine, whether that would help them. Right. Well, I think mentorship is critically important, and there have been many people involved who helped me shape my career and who helped me to get to the point where I'm at right now. I would um, mention Huda Zagbi and Arthur Baudet in particular, who over the years became true role models, not only as physicians and scientists, but in many, many aspects of life. Um, and. I would say a good mentor is almost like a good parent to you. There's a lot of love and support and guidance. But also, you know, at times the relationship between the mentor and the mentee can be just like between a teenager and his parents. It can be challenging and the mentee may feel that they're asking too much. Um, but I realize that, you know, it is because they want to push you. They really want you to develop to the fullest of your potential. And that is what some of these mentors have done, uh, which I'm forever grateful. Now, it's interesting as you know, I'm getting into a position now that I see myself becoming the mentor of others as well. And I also hope that some of the relationships that I have with my mentors will continue over the years because I think you know, that's a lifelong process. But as a mentor myself, um, I teach graduate students in the laboratory now. Um, I'm the mentor to medical students and residents in the clinic. Um, and I'm also involved on a national level. I'm currently the vice president for education with the American College of Medical Genetics. And we really work and think hard about how best to educate the next generation of geneticists in the United States. Mm -hmm.